I'd like to welcome everyone here today. I just thank you for taking out time of your busy schedules to join this symposia. This is originally going to be presented at the Academy, and we're super excited to present Ruth Jackson Orthopedic Society in conjunction with the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons and the Women in Arthroplasty Committee about harassment. And we strongly believe that harassment is everyone's issue. And our goal here is to understand how to optimize our work environment. We have three dynamic speakers here today who are really going to showcase these different areas. So we have Casey from, who's gonna talk about the background of sexual harassment. Marlene's gonna talk about definitions. And Judy Beth is gonna really give us a call to action. So without further ado, I'd like to have Casey start us off. And it's completely appropriate that I'm the one who gets to thank the American Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society, as that's my society, and they're helping to support us by loaning us the software to have this platform. So um, I'm going to talk about the ethics of sexual harassment as a way of introducing the background in kind of a different way. For full disclosure, I am faculty at the Berman Institute of Bioethics, so this is definitely my boondoggle, so you're stuck listening to me talk about it. My disclosures. Are contemplating coming up. There we go. So I was contemplating how I could define why we have a need for this talk. And I was on my Twitter feed when I came across this exchange where a woman, um, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, calls out a man, Mike Pence, who has previously expressed deep skepticism of documented science from climate change to homosexuality to good health policy in Indiana during an HIV outbreak. And instead of arguing with her on the merits of this argument, Ted Cruz, who's actually a very famous debater, basically says that because she lacks a Y chromosome, she clearly cannot have an opinion on this. And this is the debater's form of so your mom, which isn't really much of a debate. So this seems like a great way to start and frame the conversation. In terms of the history of sex-based discrimination, uh, in terms of legal terms, it's fairly recent. If you haven't seen On the Basis of Sex, I highly recommend you see it so you can know all about RBG. Um, and she was instrumental in helping make this part of our legal system. And then sexual harassment itself became a common concept uh, with the Anita Hill incident. So why is sexual harassment wrong? And importantly, this is, seems like a silly question, but maybe it's not. In general, you have to always distinguish between what is a legal perspective in terms of what is not allowed legally and something that is morally wrong. And so I started thinking about that as someone who does philosophy and medical ethics and saying, well, what's the theoretical model to support the statement sexual harassment is wrong? And I spent a lot of time trying to find good ethical arguments against sexual harassment and the objectification of women. And I came up a little bit short. And it's a challenge when you try and go to classic philosophers because they've said some pretty terrible things. Um, Kant and Aristotle here representing some of the classic um, huge philosophers everyone learns about in college philosophy said really awful things of race. Um, but Again, why is sexual harassment wrong? There's been tons of writing actually on why slavery is wrong, but there's limited philosophical writing regarding sexual harassment. And so I decided to phone a philosopher, which is what I do when I'm frustrated. And I said, Travis, who's a good friend of mine, why isn't there anything written about this? And he had a very philosophical approach, which was, we don't actually have arguments in philosophy when something is so obviously unjustifiable, which I thought was just such a good quote I had to throw it in this talk. And he and I talked a bit further and he said, well, here's the thing, nobody can argue it because all good moral reasons stack up against sexism. It clearly causes harm, it's an autonomy violation, it creates damaging power dynamics, it perpetuates discrimination and injustice, and these are all things that there is lots of moral philosophy written about why all these things are wrong. Um, and he said, so there isn't much of an argument to be had for it. So going back to the classic philosophers, if we can forget how Kant said some pretty terrible things, um, 
he's on one end of the spectrum. So deontology or duty-based philosophy is one extreme. And you can make a pretty good Kantian argument about how the objectification of people in general and women specifically is morally wrong using his categorical imperative, which is essentially that you must always treat people as a means to an end, or never treat people simply as a means to an end, but always at times as an end unto themselves. And then if you go to the other extreme end of philosophy, so diametrically opposed to Kantianism would be utilitarianism. And um, according to utilitarians, certain actions are permissible if you have sufficient benefit and overall good. So Kant is strictly against lying, while utilitarians would allow you to lie if there were some benefit. And the classic philosophy example that people use is that Kant says that if you have the Nazis knocking at your door and you're hiding Anne Frank, you have to tell them that you're hiding Anne Frank. Whereas utilitarians say that's nonsense, that's crazy, you're allowed to lie to save a life. So even if you take an opposite philosophical approach from the Kantian, where you're looking at your duties to not objectify people, I thought, well, maybe I could try and construct an argument here to support sexism. But the only way you could construct this argument is if the overall good of harassment was great enough that it overcame these concerns. So I started trying to create a moral argument for sexism. So I started Googling and said, well, why do men sexually harass women in the workplace? And I found this article from CNBC, which was an interview with um, psychiatrists discussing why men harass women in the workplace. And as a female orthopedic surgeon, uh, the top one of these struck particularly close to home, as did honestly the third. Um, so part of it is they have a desire to protect occupational territory, um, that there's group approval of sexual objectification, and that they have perceived invincibility. And so I tried to construct an argument from a utilitarian perspective saying, are any of these good and justifiable morally? And in short, I really don't think it's possible to create this argument because the desire of some to protect their resources to the detriment of the greater group is clearly not going to be justifiable from a greatest good utilitarian perspective. Interestingly, as I went kind of down this rabbit hole of utilitarianism, I found a book by John Stuart Mill, which is not his most famous book. Um, on, he's a very famous utilitarian. Um, and he wrote this uh, based on ideas that he'd shared with his wife and his daughter. And he wrote, um, this statement, and it's interesting in particular because it was being published at the same time as the Civil War. And so he argued that the legal subordination of one sex to another is wrong in itself, and now one of the chief hindrances to human improvement. And it ought to be replaced by a system of perfect equality, admitting no power and privilege on the one side, nor disability on the other. And um, if you go a little bit deeper into this book, and this is a little bit of a John Stuart Mill sidebar, um, he had some really great arguments that I have now found myself uh, looking to deploy in conversations today, because he called out a lot of contradictions in the arguments, uh, particularly of men, um, in terms of how they contradict themselves within the argument. So often arguments have been made, and let's be honest, they were made not that long ago against women doing orthopedic surgeons, perhaps in some quarters it's still made, that women cannot do an activity and therefore women must immediately stop doing the activity, what they just said that women weren't capable of doing. Um, I'm sure everyone has seen the famous uh, image of the first woman running the Boston Marathon and the men trying to stop her from doing this thing that they knew that she couldn't do. Um, so I, I think that this is a great way to point out the contradiction. And if we want to go to a more modern support from a utilitarian perspective, we can go to Janet Yellen, who um, has this wonderful quote, is often said we should welcome women's presence in the workplace because it would allow us to capitalize on the talents of our entire population, and this is certainly true, but it's also good business. A number of studies on how groups perform indicate that workforces that vary on dimensions such as gender, race, and ethnicity produce better decision-making processes and better outcomes. And in that same talk, she talked about maximizing women in the workforce would increase GDP for 
So I think that it's pretty clear to see there are clear moral arguments against the subjugate, subjugation of women and sexual harassment, and you can use multiple philosophical perspectives to support it. So if we can say that something's morally wrong, should we then just try and go back to whacking this around as a legal issue? Well, we have an attorney on the line, so we can have that discussion more in depth later. But I would argue um, that no, even if morality is settled, we shouldn't focus only on the legal issues. And here's the reason. There's some limits of approaching things from a legal approach. For example, in the state of Arizona, this is a very fun thing to do, by the way, when everyone's bored in their quarantine time, start Googling ridiculous laws from different states. So in Arizona, it is illegal for men and women over the age of 18 to have less than one missing tooth visible when smiling. In Hawaii, if you ride in the backseat of a car without a seatbelt, you will be fined, but you can ride unrestrained in the back of a pickup truck. So the point being that laws don't always make sense and therefore arguing about this strictly from a legal perspective may not be as strong as arguing about it from a moral perspective. And in fact, this argument has been put forth by other people where um, these two psychiatrists had an article that um, said basically if instead of having people view sexual harassment um, in a legal manner, you view it as immoral or unethical, you're going to be more likely to change people's behavior. And I found this really interesting and there was actually a recent study looking at how to change people's behavior um, with texting while driving. And interestingly, when the law changed, it didn't change behavior. But if you could get people to believe that it was the wrong thing to do and something that was immoral, that actually changed behavior. And there's a lot of other examples that you can think of where things being thought of as being wrong or immoral was more powerful in driving um, public behavior change. Um, and even on things where there's limited enforcement mechanisms, which I think may be the case in sexual harassment. So instead of necessarily only arguing about this being something that people need to stop doing because it's illegal, I think we're gonna make a stronger case if we argue you have to stop doing it because it's immoral and wrong. Further, it's important to know that morality as opposed to legality is a societal construct. And just like um, objectification of women tends to be a societal construct, that's the same way we're gonna to have to counter it in our culture. And so I think that when you're talking about moral norms, um, that even if a individual believes that their behavior isn't morally unacceptable, if they believe that their behaviors are deviant from the social norms, then they will avoid the behavior. So we may not be able to convince everybody that what they're doing is wrong. So instead, what we need to do is change the social norm so that no one would ever feel comfortable doing the behavior in public. And I think that um, in order to try and expand the conversation, we really have to look at the moral weight that we give to sexually harassing behavior and move this from strictly a legal conversation into a moral and ethical dimension. And I also think that this is why the he for she movement and bystander movement is gonna be a really powerful way to move this forward because that's changing the societal norm on the basis of a moral norm and that's how we can get more engagement from our colleagues. So with that, I'm gonna stop my introduction in terms of the ethics of sexual harassment and I'm gonna hand it off to my next panelist. Thanks so much, I really appreciate that, Casey. It's a great way to frame the discussion on sexual harassment. And it just seems to be a topic that I don't think we discuss regularly in our practices. So for all the attendees who are here, I think you all recognize that this is something of great importance. Either we experience, have experienced it ourselves, have seen it before, or understand that the world experiences it. So to really get deep into the weeds here, uh, Marlene's gonna talk about harassment definitions and definitions might seem boring, but they're actually vital to understanding this topic more in depth. And I know I'm gonna learn from this as well. So without further ado, Marlene. Thank you very much, ladies. Uh, here are my disclosures. 
uh, and I'd like to direct you to a handout that you'll be able to download with some of these um, definitions because some of them are a bit wordy. So fundamentally, harassment devalues and demeans a target group. And the most important thing to me is that the target's merit is either disregarded or greatly devalued. And um, I think Henry Mc Harvey McKay definitely would uh, not be interested in that. So the background, harassment is widespread in healthcare among both men and women uh, outside the federal government. The process of managing harassment and dealing with it may be unclear or absent at your organization. Harassment is based on negative behavior, which is offensive, abusive, demeaning, and it's exclusionary. And I personally like to think of it as the three U's. It's unethical, unprofessional, and unproductive behavior. <clears throat> Harassment has been known to be associated with toxic work environment because what happens is for everyone, not just the target group, people see what's going on and there's poor morale, there's absenteeism and there's decreased performance. And it was so uh, noted in the military that General Odierno basically said, we are not tolerating this and toxic leaders will be fired. And the word fired is rather unusual within the military. It's, it's often people are transferred or they have different jobs, but fired is a very big deal everywhere. So here's, we're gonna go over some definition of specific uh, terms. And here's one of my uh, practice colleagues who um, would be mortified if he had to work with people that were harassers. <laughs> comes from uh, the word harasser. I don't speak French, uh, but it's from the French. Um, and what we want to note is that the effect of this verb, this action-oriented verb, is negative, creating an unpleasant or hostile situation. And um, we will see that the legal definitions do come from the, um, you know, the, the language definition. And the thing that's really interesting is that the state and institutional definitions vary. The federal definition is very clear and the federal definition supersedes all state and private definitions. The federal definition and the enforcement of the federal definition goes back to 1964, not that long ago. Um, it's Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Um, the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission, and again, this gets back to our uh, handout, and there's a web link there, that it's in a, a type of employment discrimination. Fundamentally, harassment illegal. It's an employment discrimination that violates Title VII. And the amendments, the adjustments of the Civil Rights Act of Title VII, which was in 1967, the, the age, ageism, and then the American Disabilities Act in 1990. Essentially, it's stating that it is unwelcome conduct. So it's conduct that you do not ask for, whether it's explicit or implicit, based on protected categories. We'll get into that. But those protected categories are race, color, religion, sex, including pregnancy for women, national origin, age older than 40, disability, or any type of genetic information. And so what we're talking about is unlawful conduct. And conduct includes word, act, and deed, which is offensive, where the environment would be intimidating hostile or abusive, where there is retaliation, and that's where we've heard about the whistleblower anti-harassment laws, but basically someone who's speaking out, we're not gonna have a harassment here. And then someone retaliates against that person who's upholding a, a fair work environment. And, and when there is abusive conduct against the person who opposes harassment. So what's offensive conduct? Well, 
That's not too hard to understand. It's jokes, objects, pictures, slurs, name calling, you name it, that results in insults. And these types of conduct can interfere with work performance when it's so common, so frequent, that it makes it hostile and impossible or nearly impossible to do your work or when there's an adverse employment decision. So if there's bad conduct that results in a person not getting a good review or promotion or, or extra money. So discrimination refers to um, the, this treatment or consideration of the target group, which is based on their categories. So if we're with a group where there's mostly women and there's male minorities like an RJOS, and we don't treat them as equal members, then we are discriminating. Um, and it, it looks like the candidates, or rather the uh, members of the target group are not being considered on their merit. Again, violation of the Civil Rights Act, Title VII. Interestingly, and this is something I learned, that with, there's an intent to discriminate. This is also illegal. So when there's pre-employment inquiries, like a lot of us got when we were being interviewed for orthopedic residency or some other jobs, all the listed items here are illegal because it's the intent to discriminate based on your marital status, pregnancy, family planning, and your spouse. So whether you, whatever group you are, so you know, if, if a male is asked, you know, what plans are you to have regarding, you know, your your children at home your caregiving at home, this is not legal. So I, I have often been asked, um, especially since my last gig, so to speak, as president of Ruth Jackson, which I was so honored to do, um, is what's the difference between harassment and discrimination? Well, an, an example that I always think of is in discrimination, you know, someone asks, did you get the job? No, I didn't get the job because of a, a, a something as part of your target group. So in this case, because I'm pregnant or because I'm black or because I'm Asian or because I'm older than 40, that is discrimination. Harassment is like when you, perhaps you have the job and someone says, oh, how's that new job going? And you're like, you wish you never took it because in this particular case, I've been gaslighted. I've been excluded from, my, from meetings that include my own department. I've been excluded from decisions that involve my grant, my research, that's harassment. So here are the protected categories, as I was explaining again, it's in the handout, but the, and, and you, you can see the details related to this, but basically if it has to do with your marital status, your gender, your race, your color, your religion, your age, or if you have a disability, um, <laughs> which may include a specific medical diagnosis. It may not be that you, you know, are, are paraplegic or an amputee. It could be a, a medical condition or your national origin, your birthplace, your ancestry, your culture, or your linguistic characteristics. So if someone has English as not their first language and they have an accent and they're not being included as, uh, as everyone else, that, that's, that's wrong. I wanted to spend a little time on Aggression, macroaggression, and microaggression, because this is, uh, these are words that come up a lot. Aggression, or what might be termed macroaggression, is when there's intentional, purposeful actions that exclude, hurt, or hurt, or exploit people, this target group. And some horribly extreme examples are those we'll never forget, they're so awful. The actual racism, link, lynching, physical abuse, um, genocide, uh, and then more recently, less awful but equally illegal, is explicit sexism and exclusions of disabled persons. I wanted to spend a minute on bullying. Uh, this is also not allowed because it's it's a cyber. It can be cyber or in person, but the bottom line is that it's an attack, attack, intimidation overbearing power to this target group to cause fear or harm when there's no provocation from the victim. And then cyberbullying has a, a, a definition, um, but it's basically an extension of bullying in, in social media or online. So microaggression is 
something where there's an action which could be conscious or unconscious, where a person unintentionally expresses prejudice or an attitude to the marginalized group, the target group. And it, it basically is, again, negative behavior that may be invisible for, to the perpetrator, but it makes it Im impossible for the person to do their job or, or perform well. Again, negative behavior. Oh, okay. I was, um, so, so Professor Chester M. Pierce, an amazing psychiatrist responsible for this idea of global psychiatry, um, was an advisor for many groups. His um, brilliance and uh, was noted when he was in the Navy. He went to Harvard and essentially defined microaggression as these indignities or insults, usually brief, whether they're intentional or not, verbal or nonverbal. But basically, they they hurt that group, and it all it demeans that group, and it sort of gets them in this sort of vicious cycle of of um, demeaning negative behavior. And then the further uh, going on, uh, Sue was a psychologist who identified forms which were micro assault, micro insult, micro validation. And they range from everything from behavior to remarks to subtle snubs and exclusionary nullification type behavior. So um, I know you're all out there in um, the, the cyber land, so to speak. So here we have a, 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 a person uh, moderating uh, or introducing at Grand Rounds and our our respected colleague here uh, is introducing our guest, and the, the, the uh, moderator uh, refers to the guest speaker for Grand Rounds uh, as Maria. And so which form is this? Is this micro-assault, micro-insult, or micro-validation? So I'll give you a minute to scream out your answers there. I know you're right. I know you've got it. And what is it? It's micro-validation. And this is when there's lack of inclusion or being ignored or misidentified. And what's fascinating is that women do it a little bit less than them, uh, but not much less. I mean, it was statistically significant, but you know, I would I would hope, especially our, we at RJOS and our colleagues and um, our friends at the other societies that are working with us, um, we'll do what is normal for your institution. If you're at a friendly institution and you don't use a proper title, fine. But um, if you're at an institution where you're a little more formal, you should use the person's proper title because women scientists and physicians are significantly less likely to be introduced by their proper title. So um, when we see the difference again here, summing up um, at the end, the difference between harassment and discrimination. Discrimination is an adverse action on a protected group under the law, that target group that, that the American federal system, judiciary system has identified, that protected trait. And then uh, the sexual discrimination, for example, would be bias against that employer, employee rather, or group based on their gender. Um, could be male or female. Harassment is unfair, unwelcome, or abusive treatment towards an employee. There's often a pattern, and there are many types of abusers. And for example, sexual harassment could be you not getting a job or promotion um, because of your gender, or getting that job or promotion depends on sexual favors, or you're being subjected to unwelcome sex sexual conduct. And we do see this, um, I hate to say, among women uh, leaders and in power, it does not appear to be as often as males, but there are women that will make those advances against males. Um, please remember the Title VII uh, Civil Rights Act of 1954. This was the federal law that's been upheld by the Supreme Court over and over and over again that makes this behavior illegal. It is federally illegal to not value people based on their merit 
And as you know from our RJOS uh, web, uh, RJOS uh, newsletter, I frankly consider it un-American. I just want to make a quick note about the Uniform Code of Military Justice. It is different. Um, enlisted and officers are held to the, to the uh, a code of behavior, but harassment uh, only until recently was a standalone under the UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, and they're still working this out. But um, it really is a little gray area there, and hopefully they will uh, address this. So in closing, I just want to say that what is on the Equal Opportunity Commission page, prevention is the best tool to eliminate harassment in the workplace, and we in medicine know a lot about prevention. And um, my last slide is the next slide, which has the resources which are on our uh, the handouts and um, are, are listed. I know we're moving the mouse to the next person uh, who will speak. And as that's happening, I would just like to say that the um, materials and the webinar will be available about a week from today. And um, I, I, I look forward to the questions at the end of the session. We appreciate the information that you provided to us. On the right-hand panel, if you look, there's a bunch of panels there and one of them says questions. If you can type your questions in there, we have time at the end of our webinar to discuss more of these questions. And I'm excited to introduce, introduce Judy Beth to us now because she's going to give us a more of a live discussion. And, you know, we all wish we were doing this in person because we're missing out a lot of facial expressions and being able to talk about this in depth. But this is the closest thing. And we hope to do this again, actually, at the Academy next year. So for all those who are dialed in, we hope to be able to do this again. So without further ado, Judy Beth is going to talk to us more about action steps, what we can do in the era of sexual harassment. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I had planned not to do a PowerPoint because I was hoping to make this more of a conversation, um, mostly because the decision whether or not to take legal action or to file a lawsuit is actually very personal. And um, it's it's uh, better if you think about it as a conversation from the get-go. So um, I wanted to thank my co-panelists. I, I wanted to specifically thank Marlene, who can now, uh, in my opinion, um, give a sexual harassment seminar to a group of lawyers, and to Casey for bringing up so many important, what I would call alternate dispute resolution um, me uh, mechanisms, um, changing culture, uh, looking at it as a moral issue and not just a legal issue. Um, but we'll, we'll touch upon all of that. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is, so when do you sue um, and what does that look like? And I think that um, the litigious nature of our society is that we think that um, if we've been wronged, we should sue. If, if we feel like um, we've been harassed, we should automatically sue. Um, and that, of course, is always an option. But it's, in my mind, um, should never be your first thought. Um, doing, being part of litigation takes a lot of time. Um, I'm hoping that no one in the audience has ever been sued. I imagine um, maybe one or two of you has been part of a malpractice case. I hope not. But anyone who's had that experience knows that it's physically and emotionally draining and can kind of take over your life. Um, so when you think about suing, I think you should think about that as, as a last case after you've exhausted other avenues. Um, but if you're going to sue, what does that look like? Well, um, I should tell you as the, at the offset that um, actually employment discrimination cases do very well because um, typically, the person who's being discriminated against does not call a lawyer at the first sign of harassment. Typically, um, the situation has been going on and on, and someone says, you know, I've had enough, and, and this has become untenable, and the, that's when they seek out a lawyer. Um, so I want to address a couple things. One is how, how do you choose a lawyer? Um, we don't really talk about that. And in many ways, it's the same as choosing a doctor. What do you want from your lawyer? Well, um, there is a model of lawyering called client-centered representation. And what that means is it's an attorney who um, operates from a perspective that the 
client is a full partner in all the decision making. Very much like I'm sure all of you are in your practices that when you have a new patient coming into your office, you want to show them compassion. You want to explain everything. You understand that your role is not just as a physician, but actually as a, a teacher. Really good lawyers are really good teachers. Really good lawyers take the time to explain everything to their clients. Um, and they have dialogues. They don't have diatribes. They, they talk um, and they want feedback. And they ask questions, not just about your situation, but about you so they can get a full sense of you. Just like if someone comes into your office, um, you will ask them questions that might not seem relevant. A, as crazy as it sounds, a good lawyer is going to ask you questions that may not seem relevant, like your background, your education, um, what, what's your family like? They're looking to see um, how you will be as a client and as a potential witness. So while it may feel a little like, um, man, why are they asking me all these questions? There's, there's a reason. And that's in part because they want to feel this sense of partnership with you. You should never be with a lawyer who won't discuss with you how often they'll be in touch. Now, they may not bring it up. Um, I happen to, um, when I'm, I'm not uh, enjoying my time with you guys, I happen to be a law professor, and I spend a lot of time teaching my students about how to set up a mechanism with their attorneys, uh, or rather with their clients, talking about how often they'll be in touch. One of the things that is very, very frustrating for a litigant is they can go months without hearing from their attorney. When that happens, it doesn't mean that the attorney isn't thinking about your case, they just have other cases and there's nothing happening with your case. But a really good compassionate attorney will set up with you, um, you know, we'll check in every three weeks, we'll check in every month, we'll check in every two weeks, whatever feels right to you. A good attorney will make you feel like you have ownership, which of course you do in this situation because it's your situation. A good attorney will um, ask your opinions about what you'd like to do moving uh, forward. I often use the example, although it's kind of a silly one, of um, we had done a big remodel in my house and we had worked with a designer who would always bring me three choices and she would say, out of these three choices, what do you like the best? And in many ways, a good attorney does the same thing. They bring you different options and they say, what do you like the best? Um, most cases do settle out of court, especially harassment or discrimination cases, because especially in your situations, a large medical group or a hospital um, doesn't want to fight this in court, doesn't want to go into a situation where it could be publicized about um, the bad behavior, the illegal behavior that some of their doctors um, or administrators are participating in. So they are going to be more willing to settle. Now, having said that, there's always a chance that you'll go to trial. And trials, um, typically you won't go to trial from anywhere from two to three years, um, especially now with the situation with COVID-19 and all the civil courts in the country have basically shut down that backlog, I think it'll be more likely that it'll take three to four years. So it's a three to four year commitment to participate in something um, and then end up, you know, having to testify at a trial. Um, now that's a very difficult thing. It's very hard to um, go to trial. And whenever you go to trial, you have um, the uncertainty of knowing what the jury will ultimately decide to do. And um, in my experience, having been a trial attorney for about seven years, um, juries are very, very unpredictable. And that's actually why most hospitals and large medical groups will want to settle. Um, but they may take it, as they say, to the courtroom steps or the courthouse steps, which means that they may not settle to the very end. So if you're going to sue, um, you have to really steel yourself up and understand that this is going to be a three to potentially four year process, that you're, there's going to be a lot of hurry up and wait. There's going to be, oh, my God, we need this information from you and that information. We need you at a deposition. And then you can go six months or nine months and nothing is happening in your case, which can be incredibly frustrating. Again, if you're going to sue, pick a lawyer who really goes through a timeline with you, who really sets out their expectations of how this will all play out. If you are thinking right now, um, if you're in this horrible situation where you're being harassed continually and you think um, the only solution is to 
to go to court. These are things I'd like you to do um, in anticipation of that, even before you call a lawyer. So if you're in a situation where you feel as though you're being harassed or discriminated against, um, keep a journal. Write down every instance um, where the person or people who are harassing you, um, what they are doing, what they are saying, date it. Um, and it's very important that you tell someone contemporaneous to the harassment. In other words, to have a witness, to have an independent person who could go to court or to a deposition and say, yes, my friend Dr. Jones um, was groped in the operating room and she was horrified and she didn't know what to say. And when she came out of the operating room, she called me to share what had happened with her. Um, because that kind of evidence is actually considered good evidence for a jury um, or a trier of fact, like a judge. Um, because it's contemporaneous, right? And the feeling is, is that the person's not going to make it up. They're not going to be in the operating room in an hour later having a drink with a friend or on the phone with a friend or your sibling. Um, try to stay away from spouse because there's always a sense that a spouse is not unbiased. But if you have a friend or a sibling or a coworker, please make sure that you always um, tell them and keep keep journaling it, keep writing about it. Um, as hard as that may be, that is going to be the stuff that your lawyer has to use either to get a settlement or to get a trial. So, so please make sure you do that. Um, another thing is that at a certain point, you should involve human resources. Now, it's tricky to involve human resources because human resources, they work for the hospital where you work or the medical group where you work. Um, but you need to document things or you should document things with the company. Um, and basically a hospital or a big medical group is a business and they're a company. Um, and so it's very important that you document that with, with them. Um, so let's say you're not in the moment where you're thinking, okay, it's, it's time to take it to the next step. It's time to get a lawyer. Um, let's think about some other things. First of all, the legal system in a very large way has moved to what's called alternate dispute resolution or ADR. Um, that is a preference that everyone has, uh, litigants and attorneys, and most importantly, judges to, um, to settle matters through something, some other meeting other than going to a jury trial. So that might be arbitration, that might be mediation. Arbitration, you might already be, and it's, it's worth checking this out with your hospital, you might already be subject to an arbitration clause um, to settle a sexual harassment or sexual discrimination suit. Um, and arbitration is different because you go to an arbitrator. Both lawyers get to pick who that arbitrator is. Everybody has a list of people and both sides have a say um, in who gets to be your arbitrator. You don't have a jury. The arbitrator makes the final decision. Um, in a mediation, both people, both sides get to help pick the mediator, um, but the mediation is not usually binding. If the mediation fails, then you can take that to court. You can take that to a judge and say, we tried really hard to mediate this. We tried really hard to reach an agreement, but we couldn't. Arbitrations are typically binding, so you don't have that option. You are kind of stuck with whatever the arbitrator um, does or says. So, like, what do we do about this? How do we deal with this without necessarily disrupting our lives by going in into court. And here is where I have to um, harken back to something that Casey said, which is how do you create a culture within your group to either stop harassment or stop it before it starts? Um, typically, if there's a harasser or um, a bully or someone who's aggressive in your group, typically, not always, but typically, they're, they're doing this to more than one person. And one of the things they're counting on is people's embarrassment and their collective silence. Um, so one of the things that's really important is to actually sort of feel out other colleagues to see what's going on with them. And I think a natural place to go isn't just to colleagues who are, are 
other physicians, but also people that you work with, people on the team, the nurses, the OR techs, the schedulers. Um, and you don't necessarily have to go to them right away. You can observe the way that person who's harassing you works with other people. Um, even if you're the most junior member, and even if you are the only woman, um, or the only LGBTQ person or the only trans person in your group, you still have a voice. It doesn't feel that way, and I know, but you still have a voice. So how do you get your voice heard? You get your voice heard by documenting what's happening to you and then using that when you go into meetings um, with your boss's boss. Um, you're, you know, almost everybody has a boss. My husband's a physician. I should do, do my de my disclosures. I have no disclosures except that my husband's also a physician um, in an academic setting. He's a professor of medicine at UCSD. And um, their boss, their top, top, top boss is, is not a physician. Um, she is an MBA. She's a businesswoman. And you can take something all the way up to that business person. The way hospital systems work now is that there is a business person at the top. And that business person is going to be much more concerned about the possibility of a lawsuit than your immediate supervisor or your division chief or your department chair. Um, uh, Unfortunately, uh, there has been a culture of um, white men ruling the world for millennia, and they feel very insulated sometimes, and they think that they're omnipresent, and they think they're above the law. And certainly, if your department chair or your division chief is uh, has a big reputation, or is well published, or well thought of, or has tons of grant money, or has tons of drug company money, they they feel invincible. And here they have you know people around them, sort of, um, uh, oh my gosh, you're so smart. You're the you're the greatest. You're the best. Oh my, I'm so lucky to be in your presence. Um, they that kind of feedback makes them feel immune. And if they're by nature the type of person who is going to sexually harass, um, that's just going to feed into it. But there is always going to be in this day and age a business person um, at the top of that. So going to that person, maybe not following a direct chain of command, but going up to that person is is doesn't feel like it's a safe thing to do, but it's actually a very safe thing to do because of something that Dr. DeMaio mentioned, which is retaliation. A hospital um, or medical group is, is in much more severe legal jeopardy if they retaliate against someone who's complained than just the basic discrimination. Um, I'm worried about a little bit about my time, but I just wanna say a couple of other things. Um, I like the idea of morality versus legality. These things do happen, that things change within your group because people work together to change them, because they're willing to have the uncomfortable uh, conversations. Don't, please don't have this conversation on your own. Always get the conversation going with your group. Even the people in your group who refuse to engage, um, it's okay to call a meeting and to talk about this. It's okay to call together a group of doctors and say, we have to talk about things that make us uncomfortable. That is one of the best ways to start a conversation, um, not just about your individual discrimination, but about things that are unhealthy in the group as a whole. Again, it's very unusual for someone to select someone and only harass them. Now, somebody might harass someone um, sexually, and they're the only person who's being harassed sexually, but someone may be demeaning someone else. Someone, that same person may be bullying someone else. So it's very unusual for someone who's willing to sexually harass to not also be harassing other people within your your community of your practice. I think that it's incredibly important that if you're going to sue, you have a support team. Now, if you're a, a person who's single, you don't have a spouse or a family, maybe you don't have close friends near you, you need to put together a support system just like you were going through a big surgery, just like what you might tell someone who's about to go through spinal surgery where they'll need a six to eight week recovery time. 
um, you need to have that support system in place. So some of the ones, some of the things I want to cover before we go to questions is one: if you um, are being harassed now, um, if you're being discriminated against now, and you are thinking that you're getting to the point where you have to sue, um, or it's just begun, or it's getting worse, or it's static, start that journal. Start talking to people contemporaneously to when those events happen. Start interviewing attorneys. You don't have to go with the first attorney, um, the, the first name you get. You can interview lots of attorneys, um, and that's often a very good idea because, again, you're looking for fit. You want to see that they're a compassionate person. You want to see that they're client-centered in the sense that they want to make you a full partner um, in the process. Now, obviously, just like in medicine, you know, the lawyer is going to understand the law and the procedures, just like you are the surgeon and you understand uh, the operation, your patient doesn't. But to a good lawyer makes you feel fully informed and educates you on, on the process. Remember to be the lawyer who will always keep you in the loop. Um, calls to action. Um, Start talking about this. Uh, this happens because people are silent. Start talking to coworkers about it. Start talking, don't think of just talking to um, other physicians in the group. Talk to the nurses and the OR techs and the people who schedule the appointments and, and everyone who's part of your group. Um, if the Female doctors are always called by their first name and the male doctors are always called by Dr. So-and-so. Have a meeting and, and decide we're either all first name folks or we're all doctors um, and have that same respect for nurses and OR techs. Come to a place in your group where your mantra, your moral code, your uh, mission plan is that everyone in the group, whether they're answering the phones or doing the most complicated surgeries, are treated equally and treated with a, a basic um, amount of respect. Um, start if, if you are in a very small group and there are no women in your group or no um, other uh, minorities in your group, branch out to other groups. Talk to uh, women or minorities in other groups at your hospital. Start building coalitions with other groups. And if you are thinking of filing a lawsuit, um, I, everybody has my name, I'd be happy to talk through, uh, through that process with you. Rely on your friends, rely on your peers, rely on this group. Don't suffer in silence. But also, don't think that a lawsuit is not going to take a toll on you um, as a person. It's very, very hard. Um, it's such a pleasure. I wish I we were in Orlando and um, talking face to face. Um, but it's really a pleasure to my association with this group um, is is just such a happy one because I think the women who make up this group are incredibly dynamic and um, smart and savvy and uh, are in desperate need of as loud a voice as you can have. So thank you. Thank you, Judy. Beth. That was fantastic. And it gave us a feeling of being in person, which is really nice. So if you guys look at the panel on the right hand side, there's a question panel. And if you just want to ask a question, you can unmute yourself. The other panelists too, um, Marlene and Casey, feel free to ask questions as well. Um, something as you're looking for as people are potentially asking questions is I want to bring your attention to a recent video put out by the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons. And it's with um, the Women Orthoplasty Committee and it was sponsored and it's called The Inclusion and Mutual Respect of Women in the Orthopedic Workplace. And it really does touch on the area of sexual harassment, but uh, on the money to judgment levels, we collected comments from women in orthopedics at all different stages and got comments from patients as well as other individuals that um, we worked with, colleagues and things like that and collected into one group and had males read their comments out loud. So if you haven't read that yet, seen that yet, I would definitely recommend YouTubing that. I can also video feed myself as well too to join in the fun, but um, if it doesn't come up first. Um, so one question I have probably for the whole panel is in orthopedic surgery, uh, 
comments are made commonly, you know, and the hard part is drawing the line between joking and actual sexual harassment. How, how do you differentiate that? How do you define that? And how, you know, we, we've got some really good definitions and, and when do we stand up to that? So I'll give a go at that. It's, um, it actually depends on how you feel about it. Um, it's, uh, the law is kind of funny with this. There's um, actually a concept in tort law, which is where employment law would fall into, called um, the eggshell victim. So it's how you take in that information. Um, but I think one of the things that's important is there are definitely going to be be jokes, right? Be uh, the joking, the, oh my gosh, I was joking, I was kidding, don't take it, don't be so sour, don't take it so seriously. Um, but also you should remember that even if you are someone who, you know what, joke all you want, if you need to grab my ass, grab my ass, I don't care, um, you're making it really hard for everyone else. So even if it doesn't, even if you're not the type of person that should take offense to it, um, I, I would ask that you think about the other people in your division or your department um, who might not uh, be as, um, I don't know what the word would be, be as, uh, have has as, as much of a, sh a tough shell about it. Um, because what you really want, you know, even if it doesn't bother you, you don't want to be part of a group uh, in your professional world, in your professional family, where other people are going to be made to feel badly. To piggyback on that, Judy, I think your comment about if you're the tough shell person, I think in similar to the bystander component, those are the folks we most need to speak up because we know that there are often women who are considered one of the guys, but they may be in a different position to call out that behavior and create the culture change. And um, so I think that framing can be really important of recognizing that by not saying something, you're saying a lot. And um, the failure, you know, legally as well as morally, people talk about acts of omission versus commission. And I think we so often will focus on the person saying the thing that we don't pay attention to the other five people keep their mouths shut and shouldn't. And if one of them says something, it usually stops it. This is a really great question and tremendous answers. Uh, I think that all of us in it's um, whatever group we're part of uh, can can take a shot because uh, we we're kind of tough people we're we're in a tough field we're competitive we can compartmentalize but the point is we we shouldn't have to and the other thing is that um, you know it depends on your level of training you know uh, as you move along in your career. You, you have the opportunity to be more in charge where you could set the tone of the meeting. And like Judy Beth was saying, look, you know, we, we need to have this conversation about some topics that are uncomfortable. And so if you're identifying this type of behavior, you know, you can talk about it and, and really educate people because once people feel included and worthwhile, they always perform better. The more junior people, it's a little harder. So I have you know, one thing that worked for me was like I could deal with the, you know, the double entendres and stuff like that. If something physical happened, I would say, you know, hey, back off or, you know, whatever. Uh, or leave. I'd say, well, time for me to leave the room the way the conversation is going. Um, sometimes you always, you know, you can't leave the room. But what I would say is that for other people who are in the room, you know, do something, say something so that others know that this is really not the way we want to have a work environment it's not and that's why harassment affects everybody and it makes it makes other people feel very awkward um they don't people don't like being around the, uh this type of behavior and they feel uh weak you know because if they don't have the gumption to speak up then they're conflicted and they're burdened and that's no good for anybody either. Uh, so, and, and, sorry. sorry, that's it. I'm just saying, and you know, they're going to be, I would imagine, I hope that you're going to have um, man, men in your group who are allies, um, who will also speak up if, if they realize that that's something, a way to use their power in the group to speak up. Um, 
Well, it's collective. <laughs> Uh, I would say that yes, there are those, and the testament to that is that we got you know 11 wonderful uh, you know nominees for the Heat for She Award, and there's far more many men out there like that, and power to them. The problem is that oftentimes when we're talking about this alpha person in charge, so to speak, there are many men and women who back down. And, and, and what I have seen is that they become something that they're not really because they don't want to deal with this person in charge. And so this sort of overbearing person who may be doing microaggressions or even macro, like they, they just want to have a nice career and they're like, you know what, this is just, uh, I'm just going to let this pass because I can't deal with this person. And, and it's tough because there is like that retaliation or just that uncomfortableness, like they don't want to be treated like that. And, and I see I see that not just in orthopedics, you know, it, it's out there in medicine. And I, I well, think- You girls are amazing. Oh, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Casey. Oh, no, I was just gonna say as, as an ethicist and someone who does a lot of work in moral distress, I think that's why these forums are so incredibly important. And so there's the what should be happening component that we all need to role model and work to try and change the culture. But then there's also the reality that this crud is gonna happen for right now until we keep on shifting towards our more perfect future. So um, just as a, a call out for everybody who is taking their Tuesday evening to tune into this, I think creating your micro communities so where you have space where you don't have to worry about that is really important, um, which we've worked hard to do at my own institution, but also finding mentors of whatever gender who when stuff happen, you can complain and commiserate with. One of, one of my partners has become my go-to person um, and he'll joke about it when he can see that I'm getting really bothered, but then he'll follow up and call it out in a public forum, which has shifted the culture faster than anything I can do. And and like that happened in a meeting where someone used my first name and called that person doctor. And they said, well, I'm not going to be doctor if she's not. So why don't you call me by my first name and said their first name? And guess what? That's never happened again. Right. So I think figuring out how to create allies. Um, and, but don't feel you're alone. And the world is isolating right now. I, I don't know where we'll emerge from this, but if anyone does ever feel alone, I am always on the Twitter or the Facebook or my email obsessively. And if you need to just complain to someone, drop me a line. Yeah, that's really that's what it's all about at the end of the day. Oh, go ahead, yeah. Marlene. Oh yeah, that's really great, Casey. Cause you know, some of these things, uh, again, you know, it depends on the, the, the environment. Um, you know, and sometimes it's, uh, you know, if it's something really subtle, you know, you can, you can make a joke and you, know, you don't have to always, you know, be heavy handed about it. It really just, you have to have a, a, your sense of the gravity of what's happening. And, um, you know, there are a lot of people out there who, who want all of us to excel and, and, uh, and do well. So I think, um, you know, that change in culture is, is really important and it starts with education. Because I must say when I um, joined the Navy and I was in uh, officer indoctrination school, I learned a lot of, of this that I never thought of. Like you just, especially as a resident, a fellow, you know, you just want to learn everything and operate and be your best surgeon. And you, you just kind of put all this stuff aside. You just, you know, want to get through it. But then when you're staff a junior person and you see like or a fellow like hmm it's interesting this patient asked me for my curriculum vitae but they didn't ask the other fellows like with me on the rotation and you know you 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 just uh you have to understand where people are coming from maybe very innocent but you know if they're doing those kinds of things in a work environment that's a whole different thing mm -hmm. Agreed. This is one of the reasons why this topic could be live in Orlando where we could have really enjoyed this. So thank you to all the panelists. I'm thankful to be uh, in the same cohort of you guys and having support of each other. And 
Ayako, everyone else, you can reach out to any of us anytime. And to the attendees here, thank you for being with us. I recommend you to check out that video and check out the links that uh, Marlene provided. And enjoy the rest of your Tuesday night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good night.